Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watchlist. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watchlist, where we'll be taking a close look at an individual company, sector or ETF that you may wish to consider for your watchlist. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how experts screen for value. Joining me today is Gareth Brown. Hello, Gareth. Hi, Phil. Gareth is the Portfolio Manager from Forager Fund's International Shares Team, and we're going to be talking about Blanco, and the AIM code is BLTG. And Blanco is a US data erasure software market leader listed in London. <laughs> it's a lot to get through there. I think the first thing is it's not terribly US. It's a business with roots in Finland, mm-hmm. uh, some in India as well, most of the admin teams in the UK, the CEOs in, in Silicon Valley. So it's a very much a global business, but it is listed in London. So what is the AIM? It's yeah. the Alternative Investment Market, I believe? Correct. It's a, an alternative market in the UK. It's a secondary market, much less liquid than the main boards in London and smaller companies. And a bit of a Wild West in terms of like low disclosure, different requirements. So you get a lot of... Um, companies on the aim that are, let's say, dodgy. Uh, But we've had a lot of success in the past, you know, with a high filter there and we're very, very selective, but we've had a lot of success with some of the things we've bought there in the past. So just be careful if you're fishing there, huh? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know about that. So tell us about Blanco. What caught your eye about Blanco? We've owned Blanco for a couple of years, so I'll give you a rundown of what the business does first, and then we can maybe talk about the opportunity Mm -hmm. that we got involved in. We bought it in 2017. Blanco's main business is erasure software. So when a piece of hardware, a hard disk, or any sort of computing device, mobile phone, anything like that, when it gets to the end of its natural life, you want to clear that hard disk of data for obvious reasons, security reasons. And traditionally, people either shredded, like physically shredded and destroyed the hard drive, Mm. or you can use a system you call overwrite. So you overwrite the disk, which effectively is not, clearing it properly it's more like scrambling the info hackers are getting very good at unscrambling eggs what blanco software does is it it very systematically goes and changes every spot on that hard disk over and you're really clearing it and very importantly you're getting a piece of paper that says we've done it to this standard it is clear the job has been done you can show your boss you can show your customer you can show the authorities and it's accredited by many firms around the world Mm. to do that job. And the other part of the business is mobile diagnostics. So the roots of this business is you have a problem with your phone, you take it to the AT&T store, whatever in, in whatever market, it helps you identify what's wrong with the phone. That's really morphed quite significantly now. It's actually linked in with the erasure bits. There's this big secondary market in mobile phones developing. Now, back in the old days, you'd buy a Nokia for 300 bucks. There was no secondary market. If there was, it was going to a developing world. Now you're buying apples for a couple of grand. And these things have value at the end of a couple of years, maybe $600. So there's a big secondary market Mm. developing. You need to clear it. It's all tied in with the diagnostics business now. And then there's also some other uses for... For this technology, for example, they sell it to insurance companies. If you want to insure your mobile phone, the insurance company gets you to download something. They can tell if the screen's cracked. It's all done remotely. You don't have to take it in store. Wow. (laughs) That's pretty amazing technology. Yeah. Yeah. So how did it uh, come across your table? So we found this business, Steve, our CEO, who you've had on this podcast before. We were at a broker meeting in London. They'd given us five or six stock ideas that um, we found we were pretty lukewarm on and then we were getting up we're about to leave go to our next appointment and steve said if you've got anything else something a bit hairier (laughs) and the broker was like well actually there's this company that i've i've had to cease coverage on i actually quite like it i think they've got really good tech a really good solution for customers but there's been an issue with last year's results they're going to have to restate it the ceo has been up to some dodgy stuff it's fallen 80 percent in the last two months Everyone in London is selling the stock. We've had to cease coverage on it, but maybe you should want to go and have a look at this. And that was what we started doing. It was a very unique situation where everyone was selling this stock. We did our work over a couple of weeks, realized that there's 
some real attractive asset underlying it, realized that their problems, which related to one particular geography, they'd sold some business in Mexico that didn't actually eventuate. They recorded it as revenue, which is, you know, a horrible sin, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But we realized that they were doing well in other geographies that were salvageable out of this. And we started buying the stock and we were buying 100% of the stock on several days in London. So, we looked at the end of the day, the amount that traded, it was all coming to us. So everyone else was selling. That's the kind of situation where it doesn't prove that you're right. But if you're right, you know, you're going to get a good payday if it happens. That was how we got involved. So the dodginess wasn't something that was enough to really put you off? I would say there was an asset there and a an organization that was healthy. And yep. there was a CEO and maybe a senior management team that were cancerous. And we could see how that could be cut out and taken away. And that had already happened. He'd been fired at the time. We'd learned about some of the stuff that never came out in the media. We talked to the founder, we talked to past employees, but we also did a lot of channel checks. We were confident they were actually doing really, really well in most of their geographies, but it had been managed aggressively, financially speaking. And so we were pretty confident that we could make money out of it. But yeah, it wasn't without taint. So that's a big part of your job, isn't it? Going and doing this research and actually going and meeting the people behind it, the managers, the founders and yep. everything. How much does it take to really get a company across your line? Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is it's highly variable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you come across something and it's already in your wheelhouse. You know what you're doing. It's really a few days of work and you're going in there with a thesis and all you're trying to do is disprove the thesis. And then there's other times when a sector or a business is completely new to us. It's a little bit more of a process. Maybe you're doing that work over a number of months, but not full time. This was a situation where we knew enough to know that the market was wrong. It's a big part of our degeneration process here is to try and work out why something's cheap. So we went into a business like Blanco. Half the work was on you know, what is the business? What is the operations? What underlies this? And the other half is what's the market gotten wrong here? Because if we're going to make a lot of money, it's because the market's gotten it wrong. So sort of the work is split between those two factors. Hmm. So what are the tailwinds for cybersecurity? Why do you believe it's a mega trend? Yeah, I mean, Blanco, it is a bet in that cybersecurity space, don't get me wrong. We don't claim expertise on the whole sector. It, yeah. This is a, a simple niche business it's sort of 90% market share pay to Asia globally. Like it's a really attractive, but it's a very small niche of that cybersecurity space. But I think there's a few things to recognize here. Firstly, it's just general IT spend around the world, up and up and up. It's the way companies are becoming more productive. There is more equipment each year, and that just brings more security threat. We have the cloud. So a lot of this data used to sit on servers at company HQ. Now that's increasingly moved to the cloud. So you might sit on the servers of someone like a Microsoft or an Amazon or a Google. The migration of that brings work. The operation of that brings work. And most large organizations run a hybrid. So they are partly on their own servers, partly on Google servers, increased risks around that for people to steal data. And then the work from home movement's been quite huge as well. So just, again, we now have a computer at work. We've got another one at home. It's just the proliferation of the things that you use and that are weak points in data security and general awareness around it. You know, the privacy concerns, big fines, increasingly big fines for data breaches. So it's just something that people are aware of from a reputational point of view, but also a regulatory point of view and even a financial one. Now you lose customer data, you can kill your business. Mm. So presumably, you know, there's data centers springing up everywhere all around the world because there's this huge demand for resources like this. How does big tech regulation play into this space? Yeah, I mean, privacy is just an obvious one to talk about. I think it, there's myriad ways we could answer this question, but privacy is a big one. There was the European rules a few years ago. Now we're having in the mobile world, we have Apple with the changes on cookies, just a lot of flux and it's just our lives are digital. They're increasingly digital and there's flux in the system. It's just a lot of moving parts. And let's just face it that the expected bar of privacy goes up every year and it goes up in each region. You know, Europe comes up with the rules. California comes up with separate rules. Companies come up with their own rules. So, yeah, there's a lot of background tailwind there. 
Are there any risks involved with this one? I mean, it's effectively a single product company. You know, this is not a huge business by any stretch. The diagnostics part is another strength to its bow, but it's effectively a single product company. That's something we need to keep in, in mind when we're thinking about portfolio management, how much we're prepared to invest in a stock like this. Our position is dramatically smaller in terms of the number of shares than it was back in 2017. Mm. The stock's gone up five times. You know, we've probably sold three quarters of our original holding. So diversification's a huge issue for people. And um, just before we started talking, I was talking about when I used to believe that just buying an ASX 200 ETF was diversification, and it's not. People need to be diversified across asset classes and across international markets as well. You believe that uh, strongly, don't you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I won't get into the other assets piece of it. It's not sort of... No, 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 that's me. (laughs) That's me. I'm just trying to get people to be aware of asset classes as well. I'm, I'm talking my own book here, but I do believe that most Australian investors don't have enough international diversification in their portfolio. We live in a small market, 25 million people. You know, the old trope that you used to see was 2% of the world stock market is here, you're missing out 98% of the opportunities. It's cliche. There's an element of truth. For me, though, the fundamental piece here is that Australia is a small economy. You know, we're really following Ricardo's principle of competitive advantage. We're great at iron ore, we're good at agriculture, we're good at financial services. We're good at big city services generally. You know, a few med tech examples like Cochlear that lead the world, but we can't be the best at everything. And so there's so many areas where you cannot get exposure in Australia to these sort of things. So automotive, for example, we have no automotive sector. We own Linamar. It's a tier one auto parts supplier business in Canada. They make millions of parts each year that go into new cars. So they sell to Ford and they sell to GM and other providers. What's the size of that kind of business? Uh, Six billion Canadian dollars. So it's it's a big company. And that's not even in the upper echelons of the T ones, you know, the Magna and, you know, there's a few other guys there that are tens of billions market caps, but they make millions of parts each year. They're very, very good at it. We think it's cheap, but you can't buy a stock like that in Australia. I've got a list of stocks like that that just, they don't exist. Zebra Technology, Zebra, sorry. I hate (laughs) saying it that way, but it's an American company. So Zebra Technologies make software and hardware to help mainly retailers manage their inventory. So it's a highly complex world now because most retailers, they have an online business and an offline business. So managing where that stock sits whether someone's bought it in store or bought it online, it's very, very complicated now. And you go to many stores in Australia, you'll see the retailers walking around with the handheld devices, mm. the Zebra. Great business has done very well for us. There's nothing like that in Australia. And I don't think you need to own everything, but you know we don't have much of a software sector. We don't have much of a tech sector. And a lot of the stuff that is there has kind of been... This is the sceptic in me, but it's been manufactured to fill an investor need rather than necessarily being world-class. And we can get exposure to a lot of that stuff overseas that is very different to here. And I think that's important. When you look at the basket of things that you're going to be buying over your lifetime, you're going to be buying cars, you're going to be buying hardware, and you're going to be buying a lot of different things. Australia doesn't make it. And that's fine, but it's you buy the Australian index, you're not getting a very broad diversification around that. And I think that's important over time. Yeah, not to mention technology as well. Yeah, definitely. Google and Amazon. It's, <laughs> there's nothing like it, yeah. really, is there? With your work at Forager, are you agnostic towards industries? Are you looking at anything? You're not sort of limiting yourself to any particular sectors or industries? Great question. I mean, we are very actively managed and we are not running anything that hugs an index. So we own 30 to 40 stocks. We can maybe talk about diversification later if you want. We think that's the sweet spot. We are very much valuation driven. So we don't like to label ourselves value investors these days because we don't just buy low price to bulk or low PE, but we are always valuation first. It's the bedrock of what we do and we go where the opportunities are. So we are flexible. We can buy different market cap stocks. We can buy different geographies. We can buy different sectors. We don't feel we have to own anything. We are very much opportunity driven. We are very cognizant of the benefits of diversification though. So I think you kind of got the yin and yang there. We want to go where the opportunities are, but we don't want to be totally exposed to any one idea or to any one sector or to any one geography. So we want to be diversified, but we also want a portfolio of best ideas. We don't want to own things that that we don't believe in. 
Did you want to talk about the diversification of your portfolio? Yeah, sure. So okay. we own 30 to 40 stocks. We think that's roughly the sweet spot at our size. What we want is when we buy something and it works, we want it to have a meaningful contribution to our portfolio. We want to own enough of it that it meaningfully moves the dial. But if we get it wrong and it goes down a long way, we don't want it to destroy us. And we think that sweet spot is that 30 to 40 stocks. You know, you get up around 100 stocks and you're, you're running an index fund in effect. Mm-hmm. You run 10 stocks with 10% in each. You really got to cop some volatility there. And then you're testing your investors' patience. You know, we think that we're in the sweet spot, in that sort of 30 stock range. Mm. So if people want to get some more information about Forager, where can they go? Our website, www.foragerfunds.com. I'm also on Twitter. So my handle there is forager underscore Gareth. Our CIO, Steve, is also on Twitter, forager underscore Steve. Yeah, check us out. We have a PDS online, which is an important first step if people are genuinely interested in in investing with us. But if you're just looking to get a flavour of what we do, the monthly and quarterly reports are all available on our website. We write quite detailed reports talking about things that have been working and that haven't been working and and ideas that are in the fund without giving too much away. (laughs) Gareth Brown, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, everyone. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast.